you to everyone for coming and thank you for the organization of, uh, of this day. And I'm looking forward to hear uh, the work of, uh, of everyone. So today I'm going to speak about uh, computer and archaeology. And uh, first of all, I have to give a premise that it's only one year that I've started to explore the contribution uh, that computer science can give to archaeology. And I'm still exploring and learning all these kind of things. Today I'm going to present my personal opinions of the role of computer science in the management of archaeological data. Computer basically are tools, therefore I will briefly say what, in my understanding, those tools can give to archaeology. It's not a, ma a matter of fanciness or a duty because of being in the 21st century, but it's a way in which make our work easier, faster and effective, let's say. In the last semester, I had the opportunity to don't limit myself uh, to only learn uh, in a passive way, but also to do things. Uh, I've worked on the reconfiguration of the computational management of the data from an archaeological excavation in southern Turkey, the site of Kinikoyuk. Uh, there is just a mere anticipation of where uh, we ended up. A MySQL uh, database uh, hosted on a web server uh, and accessible from a number of different uh, or different applications. We we'll come back on this uh, later. Uh, in a few minutes, I will speak about application codes, software, and so on. Uh, but as a first thing, I want at least briefly introduce uh, the protagonist uh, of the whole project I'm presenting. It's the site of Kinikoyuk. Kinikoyuk is an archaeological site located in southern Cappadocia in Turkey. The Turkish word Oyuk uh, can be translated in English as mound, uh, an artificial hill uh, that was generated by the presence of a settlement uh, over the same spot for thousands of years. Regarding our site, human occupation started around 4000 before Christ, continuing till the Middle Ages. Uh, so it's uh, 5,000 years long uh, history. At the center of this picture, you can see the citadel with Iron Age defens defensive wall uh, partially exposed. Uh, all around the citadel were present a lower town uh, where the residential and productive buildings were uh, located. Before moving to the analysis of the way in which archaeological data can be computationally managed, uh, managed uh, we have a simple but crucial question to ask to ourselves. What are the archaeological data? An archaeological site, uh, at least in my understanding, uh, is the holistic sum of the humans and natural objects deposited during a certain time windows on a certain spot. What archaeologists archeology happen to do is to infer on the basis of those objects uh, natural and anthropic process, with as a final goal the reconstruction of human behaviors in the past. On the bottom of this slide, uh, you can see an earlier on age shirt uh, from the site of Kinik. Uh, this piece of ceramic, uh, per se, is not informative. Uh, it's not able to tell us uh, any narrative. Uh, it starts to speak about the past as soon as we relate it uh, to the other entities which holistically compose the archaeological site. In short, archaeological data are networks of information. When we dig an archaeological site, uh, plainly speaking, uh, we are destroying uh, this original network. We move the earth with our trowels, with our shovels, uh, we collect ceramic, artifact, we remove buildings and other construction uh, in order to expose the areas level present underneath. Uh, to dig an archaeological site means to destroy it. This action of destruction is for paradox the way in which the archaeological knowledge uh, is created uh, in the field. When as archaeologists uh, uh, has to do is to record the network that is destroying, to record, for example, for each piece of ceramic, the location, the association, and the stratigraphic position, and so on. We can say that an ob object that is without those information attached uh, is no longer an archaeologi archaeological object. It's just an object. This network of information is characterized by a high degree of complexity. It's therefore necessary to interrogate this black box uh, in order to extrapolate the patterns uh, on which our anthropological and historical narratives are based. Data recording is therefore at the base uh, of the production of archaeological knowledge. Uh, if in the pioneering years, the excavation diaries were most of the time the only way in which uh, the context of an object was uh, recorded, uh, now the data recording is based on the shared methodology by using list, forms, and a variety of topographic survey. Let's say that in a well-done excavation for one hour of uh, actual digging, we spend one hour of uh, recording, writing, drawing, and, uh, and so on. 
With the 90s, obviously, also archaeology moved toward informatization of the data. At Kinikoyuk, since the beginning of the excavation, five years ago, was in use a simple Microsoft Access database. However, with the time, uh, a number of limitations and problems have arisen, um, and this is why we decided to reconfigure the comp computational management uh, of the data from the excavation. What are we looking for? First, uh, the safety of the data. Second, to give it to everyone involved in the project, from US to China, the access to the data. Third, uh, to develop tools uh, to use in order to extrapolate patterns from the bulk of our data. Four, to develop a data-centric structure around which create an environment of application responding to different user computational ability as well as different research questions. Finally, to be able to classify our entities without having to sacrifice the description of the individual. As a result, this is a schematic representation of the whole project. Now at the core, we have a MySQL database. The MySQL database is hosted on a web server, thanks to a pilot project run by NYU libraries. The data are accessible through different applications, a very intuitive and computer language-free interface, SQL desktop application. Thanks to Air to MySQL, it's possible to interrogate the SQL server directly from Air Studio, allowing a powerful statistical analysis. The data are also replicated in form of triples, along with the refund interrogation of the data through Spark queries. The overall philosophy behind uh, the project lies in the possibility to expand this environment in any direction supported by MySQL or a triple store database. This is, for example, the final user web hosted interface that we have created, easy and intuitive to use. It can seem trivial, but it's one of our duty to limit as much as possible the errors in the data entry, for, uh, for example. The database has been created in uh, SQL. That's a traditional and conservative choice. Uh, SQL is a stable and well-developed technology, but we are more than aware uh, about uh, its limitation. Speaking about archaeological data, first of all, uh, we are limited by the rigid structure of the table, which implies to have to establish a limited set of variables to, to record. Second, archaeological data are of, uh, often hierarchical in, in nature. A shallow bowl is a bowl. A bowl is an open form. An open form is a vessel. A vessel is a ceramic object. A ceramic object is something created by a human being. As well, poorly manage uh, the hierarchical structure. Third, with SQL database, uh, we are not able to add to our data any a priori knowledge. Because of those considerations, we decided to create a parallel version of the database expressed in RDF uh, triple structure. On this regard, we decided to use both of the two major approaches available, an ontology-based data access approach, uh, in other words, to trans the translation of SQL queries into Spark queries, combined with the use of one ontology. As OBDA, we are using on top uh, a technology that allows the creation of virtual, virtual and instantly updated graph version of the relational database. The major problem with on top are due to some limitation in the inference uh, ability of the reasoner supported by this technology. As a consequence, we decided to create an additional parallel and poor RDF graph database. Uh, for the manual mapping of the SQL database, we are employing R2 RML, uh, which is the worldwide web consortium standard as R RDB to RDF. With this approach, we were able to migrate the whole database from a relational to a triple store framework. As a graph database, we are using StarDog. This, for example, is uh, an example of the script used in order to migrate the data from MySQL to RDF. Uh, on the left and on top, uh, virtual approach. On the right, uh, to RML manual mapping. One of the major advantages of a triple store uh, or a graph database uh, is the possibility to use semantic ontologies, to communicate to the machine uh, our a priori knowledge, uh, to teach to the computer what is the meaning of the concept uh, and in which way is it related to other concept. In short, we can build an intelligent system that both humans and machines can understand. I don't want to go to so much in the details since that it will be really full of archaeological jargon. Uh, let's just say that from a conceptual point of view, our ontology is based on the distinction of six major categories. First of all, entities, everything that is three-dimensional in nature, as the site, the areas of the site, the trenches, the stratigraphic unit, the artifacts, and so on. 
the classification, so all the abstract concept uh, that we use in order to classify and describe in a normative way the single entities as the shape of a vessel, the decoration, and uh, so on. The documentation, so all the documentary objects that we archaeologists create in the field as photos, drawings, and so on. The chronology, meaning the absolute dating of the finds and the relative position in the site stratigraphy. The reliability, so how much we are sure about what we are saying. And finally, obviously, the people, so us, that we are running the, the project. <laughs> Uh, I mean, just as the last thing, uh, I want to thank the people at NYU libraries that were very supportive for all the project, and Sebastian it that followed me with uh, in all of this. So thank you. Thank you. So I wanted to share today um, a course project I ran with my students last semester, um, and the idea of these projects that I work with a lot is to try to open up the idea of new ways of using digital platforms for um, the presenting of scholarly storytelling uh, and, and to get my students to start thinking about how they can adapt to the new digital medium in a way that plays with the specificities of the medium and uh, page length the uh, affordances of multimedia and text. Can you use the mic? Okay, sorry. Um, okay. Uh, and, um, and to kind of think how the digital humanities is also a question about how monographs and journals and other forms of academic scholarship um, have guided the way we think about our work and to provide new alternative pathways. So I ran a course, this is the final site, but the, this is the website called Physical Electrical Digital. And the course asks the students to think about the way that the material culture of uh, media technologies affects the way we consume technologies, starting in the Filmic, early filmic area around 1870 to the present. Students are provided with some initial theory and history readings and then are provided with, uh, asked to choose a track, whether it is textual, sound, moving image, or still images, and to choose a research topic. And the course progresses over the rest of the semester where they go off and do research and are actually responsible for bringing um, the content to the class and leading presentations. Um, so we can see here the syllabus breaks down that there's an early set of readings, but by the middle of the semester students are making up the content of the class by presenting the material they're um, searching. So there's kind of a flipped research aspect to the course um, and a new way of opening up the idea of them involving uh, themselves in syllabus building and uh, content creation. That leads to a larger project, um, a, a series of assignments that are connected to building a final website. And rather than asking them to do a final 25 page paper, they're responsible for a number of different deliverables at different uh, points in the class. And this is a very process oriented um, project and a way to get the students to think about how to stage their work and how to think granularly rather than a single composition. They are responsible for uh, an early stage uh, track proposal to describe what track they're working on and what research they're going to do. And then at different stages they have to propose 10 dates and seven objects which will surround the general ideas of their research. So I had one student who chose um, photojournalism and wartime photography and the way that different types of cameras influenced the way wars were projected back to the public through the eyes of photojournalists. Um, so she picked 10 different dates across the timeline, usually specifically related to individual wars, seven different cameras or other technologies over that same 140 year time period. Um, and then on top of doing these seven object studies, which were 350 to 500 words a piece, um, and these 10 date studies, which were 50 to 100 words a piece, they were responsible for a 3,000 word essay that would synthesize the research of those 17 individual objects um, and dates into a single essay. And then to use a platform, a content management system called Omeka, to tie all of these different aspects of the assignment together. So the goal is to get the students to think granularly, to think modularly, to provide nonlinear narratives, to provide um, paths of exploration for the user without being as singularly driven through a single content, um, but to also give them that breadth of research and the amount of writing we expect at a graduate level course. Um, the other added benefit is the six projects my students did all end up in a single uh, 
platform. And the idea would be to teach this class in many iterations so that over time all of the dates and all of the objects end up together. So you can see that right now, actually just there are 42 technologies, um, seven each for the six students, and then there are 62 events, so 10 for each of the six students, and then all of those items, the events and technologies go together in a single collection of database of 105 objects uh, that people can navigate through at this point. Um, and if you go into any single object, we see here this was a project about art history pedagogy, here's the Google Art Project. Um, students are finding images to support their information, they're writing essays, they're doing sources. So they're doing traditional research, but they're breaking it up into separate parts. Uh, so I want to travel now through an individual project, um, which is the photojournalism. Uh, and this project was particularly effective and the student did a good job in uh, finding objects and then tying throughout her essay navigations back to objects and back from objects to different essays. So here is um, one, the dissemination of images, which was tied to the challenges of getting images from the battlefront to um, the newspapers and the, the internet and the different ways of uh, transferring those photos to audiences. Um, so here's her essay and she's got um, images tied in um, and you can see that she's also linked out to Wikipedia which was another uh, thought that we encouraged frequently um, and that each of these images rather than being straightforward images are actually links to the objects um, and that an object may be represented in an essay by an image in this case at Iwo Jima um, but that it is actually related to the object she is talking about in this case uh, the contacts one um, and and then in here, we can see that there is a link to an essay in Wikipedia, um, to Leica cameras, I'm trying to see, a, nothing particular in here. Here is a World War I photo, and this connects, this is an event and a date that then connects to an object, the Vespaca Kodak. Um, interesting thing about this uh, object I love showing is that uh, it was a court martial offense to have a camera on the battlefield. Um, but it was advertised as something you should give to your soldier um, when he was going to war. So it's like, go to the battlefield, get a court martial, and come home soon. Um, so the idea is really to lay out these, this site and this content management system, Omeka, in a way that is easy for the students to learn and creates a, a really rich site that is cross-navigable. One set of, you can see two projects here. Um, there was one on um, this project, which was about pamphlet making. Uh, talked about certain types of presses that this project, which was about comic books, also talked about. So they would share each other's objects. Um, one project talked about wet plate cameras in the late 19th century. Another talked about dry plate cameras in the late 19th century. And they were able to cross-reference their objects. And the idea is to use a back-end system that is very simple. So I wanted to show just that very quickly. And I, my clock is now hidden. Um, so Omeka is very easy to use, and, and I, I actually built the project around the fact that Omeka has a, a few features that access students to ideas like metadata um, and database management, at, but also allows for easy exhibition building. So if you go into the items list in Omeka in the back end, you can see these are the objects that we've been looking at, so the Google Art Project. Um, Omeka allows you to add certain types of metadata, prioritizing Dublin Core, which is a art histor um, not art historical, a uh, historical archive metadata set. Um, and students use some of the metadata from that Dublin Core. So we had the title, Google Art Project, the creator is Google, the date it's created, um, coverage, which we were able to use for timelines, and then the description, which would be the essay. And we were also to add, able to add extra metadata um, such as either defining them as technologies or as events, which allowed us then to organize searching structures um, within the site. Uh, and then along with all of that, we have Exhibit Builder. So we can now go in and see how the photojournalism one works. Oops, that's all I want to do. Excuse me. So Exhibit Builder allows you to set up an introductory text for your, your essay um, and then to add what are called pages. And each of these pages are constructed in blocks. 
So the students have to think about how does an essay look on a uh, page, how much content is appropriate for a page, how much it starts getting long and hard to read, um, and how to organize that material. So we have a block with text, and then we have a subsequently a block of file with text, and in this way you can add items from the collection and choose the item, the image from that item. So I encourage students to find four or five images and then just to add the same item link over and over again if they wanted to show a gallery like this. Um, there are many layout options which allow you to position the text to show different types of file sizes. Um, and you can add, you continue to add blocks constructing your argument through the visuals and the text that you have. Um, and there's a way to add more blocks at the bottom, either text with files, gallery text. You can also add date maps. Um, Neatline is another plugin that allows for geospatial information, which I'm using in a course this semester. Um, and so what the students are getting is not a high code intensive practice, but an understanding of how a content management system functions and how the content management system relates, relates directly to what will show on the screen once the user is visiting that. And it really was a question also to think about the technology we were using and how it was affecting materially our experience of the culture. So there's a, a meta experience going on with that. Um, so this is a very easy platform to use. I'm going to take my 30 seconds. <laughs> um, and one that I know is greatly supported by the library. And Zach and I have worked already thinking about Omeka a lot. Um, and I encourage people to use it as a way to think about getting students to write differently online and to provide a different path for um, online scholarship from set, play, things like WordPress and other tools. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. OK, so my presentation is going to be a bit more general at first, since this is the What is Digital Humanities panel. Uh, I wanted to provide a, an expanded understanding of DH from uh, the perspective of cinema and media studies, just to create productive dialogue. And, and once again, to, to expand sort of what could be digital humanities. Uh, and then I'm going to cover some of my project-based pedagogy. Uh, so it's important, first of all, to remember that cinema and media studies has always been attuned to technological developments and their impact on machine-made art. Uh, so even before the, the first cinematic experiments in uh, interactive storytelling and database narratives in the 90s, the pre-digital work of visionary filmmakers such as Verdoff, Eisenstein, and Bunuel prefigures uh, the database logic that is exemplary of the ways in which digital culture now organizes and interacts with information. Uh, so this idea of making the invisible visible that drives today's data visualization design is then nothing new if we relate this impetus back to early filmmakers like Verdov, who reinvented the language of cinema to reveal recombinatory patterns in the editing of audiovisual <laughs> data. Um, this anachronistically algorithmic approach to film suggests that approaches to film as data in cinema studies actually predate current data mining and digital visualization tools, yet they still overlap with humanistic inquiry at the core of the digital humanities to propose new ways of understanding, generating, and organizing knowledge. And you can see some examples here, uh, very selective from cinema's early and most recent history. Uh, although the argument that the treatment of film as a database with computational and recombinatory data has existed before digital technology, uh, this argument has already been made in relation to filmmaking, as you can see here, uh, and yet little critical attention has been paid so far to the fact that what we now conceive of as the digital humanities approaches <coughs> to the study of film um, are also evident as far back as early film theory. Uh, and in fact, certain influential theories such as Eisenstein and Lev Kulshov, now critical makers uh, in DH terms, use metric approaches to cinema in their film theories in addition to their critical practice. Uh, and I'm particularly interested in Kulshov, who was keen on investigating the differences in the cultural perception 
of films produced in different countries by comparing the number of shots and the impact of montage in certain national cinemas. Uh, so Kulshov and his team then proceeded to analyze the potential psychological reasons and ideologies behind the cross-cultural discrepancies in the assemblage of nationally specific films, linking them to causes such as the impact and development of capitalism in various socio-political contexts. So uh, Kulshov's methodology sets a very productive precedent for metric-driven inquiry, where the emphasis is not on the methods of data collection and retrieval, um, but on the humanistic research questions that actually drive the need for gather gathering data in the first place. Uh, and just very briefly, um, so the use of metrics, or as now called cinemetrics, in film history and theory have now become commonplace thanks to easily accessible platforms and software such as Yuri Tsivian's Cinemetrics, uh, which make entire periods of, in film history easier to study and compare. Uh, and then before I move on to my projects, um, this is sort of a very selective compilation of other uh, digital humanities approaches to cinema, such as GIS mapping, database analytics, uh, and annotated collaborative online archives um, that, once again, sort of expand uh, what could be the age. Uh, and just to start to talk a little bit about my work, I'm particularly interested in participatory amateur and DIY do-it-yourself collaborative projects that have the potential to result in innovatively productive ways of rethinking both historical archives and the ways in which audience participation can produce new modes of inquiry and historiography. And these are some examples that have inspired my own um, pedagogical approaches. Uh, so even before the popularity of DH and the proliferation of digital media in our daily lives, film historians, theorists, and cinephiles began to draw attention to a people's history of cinema that recognizes the, important, uh, the importance of local and community production and consumption practices as fundamental aspects of movie history and media analysis. Uh, and I believe that moments of dissonance and inconclusiveness in clusters of data can shed light on, for instance, the diversity in film audience reception practices precisely in their resistance to being neatly classified into patterns. So this is just a, um, a class project that I did uh, focusing on social media repurposing in cinema studies. So, the, so each student was tasked with picking a social medium, uh, anything from Facebook, Vine, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, and uh, smartphone apps, uh, and turning it into a makeshift archive to document their impressions of an interactive film screening. So the objective uh, for the students was to reflect on the potential contributions of social networking tools to the documentation of subjective, ephemeral, and collective moments in film experiences while proposing an alternative network mode of film historiography. And I experimented with different ways of curating the um, the sort of innovative approaches that students generated, and this is just one of them. Uh, I used a platform called, called Thingling uh, to organize some of the data, and it's interactive, so if you click on some of the icons, for instance, up there, uh, we made a, a video of the <laughs> sort of summarizing the experience. Uh, then some of the research questions, uh, just to contextualize and give direction to the student contributions. Um, a few more research questions, the assignment, uh, more about the interactive screening and how it fit into this particular course, and also suggestions for how it could be adapted to other contexts, for instance, early cinema, Hollywood cinema, and so forth. Uh, and then um, some theoretical sort of uh, incorporations. And if you click on any of the students, uh, there are hyperlinks that will take you to their own website where they also accompany the media they generated with their own analysis of the assignment and uh, how productive they thought it was uh, in terms of the study of cinema. So this is um, one example where 
using pedagogy to advance the age research can actually result in innovative and also unexpected outcomes because I can't fully predict what the students are going to generate and how they will approach the assignment and that's what I really love about it. Um, and I also do experiments where I try to harness the distracted modes that Mario mentioned in the introduction of reading, viewing, and listening into what I like to call multifocused modes of interaction and multimodal engagement. So I tried to do that in different ways and I wanted to end with this. So this is my most recent experimental project, um, which is a live film scoring remix where students brainstormed on picking sound clips to add a new soundtrack to early silent cinema films. And we were studying sound uh, in relation to, to Im moving images. Uh, and then this sort of uh, what started as a spontaneous class experiment then escalated into a live DJ performance with audience participation for my film theory graduate course. And it really helped students reflect on alternative, interactive, and social modes of watching films and thinking of film and sound as elements in remixable databases. And you can see some of the steps in our brainstorming process here. Um, and so just to end, I think it's, it's important for cinema and media studies to propose broader definitions of digital, the digital humanities approaches in order to maintain certain productive modes of inquiry that stem from older methods of analyzing the moving images. So we still do textual analysis and we focus on ideological readings, on the close reading. So for me, it's not about replacement of certain established methodologies in the field because they do have their merits. They've been used for uh, over hundreds of years, so I don't want to completely displace them, but I want to expand our ways of approaching cinema and at the same time also expand uh, what it means to, to work within the digital humanities uh, and to give students a sort of stake in expanding the field as well and producing innovative approaches to sometimes films where they feel like nothing new can be added to their, their understanding. Um, so, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that really interesting first panel. Um, what came out so, so strongly for me from what you were saying collectively uh, was, as Marina nicely put it in that third talk, digital humanity is often about making the invisible visible. And I think you were all talking about three rather different conceptions of what the database can do, making the invisible visible. Lorenzo is talking about the database dis preserving something that you destroy and that you destroy in order to create that database. And then Kimon was talking about creating a new web of networks, really, I think. Your, your sort of very hyperlinked projects that you're talking about, sort of drawing out these new collections, new patterns that hadn't necessarily existed before. So I think these are three really interestingly different conceptions of the idea of what the database, the power of the database, which I think is at, at the core of, of a lot of digital humanities work and what it can do for us. So thank you to all three of you. We have 10 to 15 minutes for questions now for any one of the three of our speakers or general questions about DH or bringing these things together. Uh, let me bring you a microphone. Hi, um, I have a question about uh, using a librarian or using a consultant at the university regarding copyright. Did either of you or I mean did anyone, um, if, you're, if you're working with students and getting them to use images and upload images, are you considering that? Um, were you working with a librarian for citation or how they would work with their source material? And then finally, are you concerned about curation? Are you, are you, you know, these are hosted websites. Are, have you, do you have a plan, a long-term plan for these? Or are they, will they be up as long as it's convenient and then down? I, I can answer some of that. Uh, the copyright thing, I, so I used to run a digital media lab at the Bard Graduate Center. <coughs> And uh, we also had exhibition spaces. And so we talked about copyright a lot. And 
what what happened at CAA last year actually was a discussion that a lot of the copyright um, panic is actually self-limiting, um, and so. I probably should talk to April, and I know that more, but I also know that there is now a clearer line of what counts as fair use, and I, I didn't do it with th this class because getting that much content and that much work is 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 really intense, um, and the copyright issue, I did my entire dis dissertation on intellectual property rights, and it's a kind of a big rabbit hole, um, and so I think that usually when you're doing a pedagogical project which recontextualizes text, which doesn't provide high resolution images um, and is showing no profit, you're checking off so many boxes of fair use, it's a question of doing that. That all said, like I now know April and we have to have a basic conversation. April Hathcock is, what's her title exactly, Zach? Scholarly Communications Librarian. Yeah, right, and, uh, and she actually has a background as, an, as a lawyer in, in intellectual property, so she's to have that on campus in the library is a phenomenal resource that we have at NYU that I didn't have at the BGC. Um, but I did a project where there was all these ads for computer history and um, I told them we don't need to get copyright clearance and the conservative exhibition freaked out. They went and tried to get copyright clearance. All of a sudden we have $2,500 requests for ads that are completely available on YouTube that they don't take down. Um, and I had to tell them just stop, we're putting this stuff online and we got no takedown notices. So it's, it's a conversation that's really in flux and I think what we need to do is take our fair use politically in hand a little bit more, but do it with the librarians on board. Yeah, my concern is really the discussion with the students about it. Like yeah. You kind of said you had so much to cover you could. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, and, and to be honest, it was something that came, I teach two core digital humanities courses, and, and I didn't do it this year in the two courses, and I think I need to find a way to tie that in more. Um, as far as the, the storage, uh, I feel like one of the great things about pedagogy is it can be a little more ephemeral. Um, so my feeling is as long as the uh, project is on. One nice thing about using a, a content management system like Omeka or working in SQL is that there's a very good chance you can kick it over to something else in another way. Maybe not all the visuals and everything, but you can actually take that database and transfer it and you have that underlying information. Um, so that's kind of like, I'm not too worried about it, but I also make choices that lend themselves to some kind of longer term rather than doing it in a really customized way. And uh, just to add to that, I, I am worried about the ephemeral nature of uh, some of the, the projects that my students and I generate. Uh, and, f and now, I, so I have two practical <laughs> solutions. So one is uh, I've been using Critical Commons, which is sort of uh, a website that's, uh, that was created by film and media studies scholars. To, uh, so everything that you post on Critical Commons is under a, um, um, uh, creative Commons license. So for me, especially when we're sort of using uh, sort of copyrighted tracks to create new soundtracks, that's where I will host the videos from this from this live screening because YouTube actually stripped the sound from my experiments. So there's no point in sharing them there. Uh, so Critical Commons is very useful, and then. Uh, uh, Web Recorder is an archiving tool that has been recently launched. It's open source, they're both open source by Rhizome. And so I've been asking my students to actively use Web Recorder to archive their websites so then you get a work file uh, that you can use on different operating systems and you have a record of what your website looked like and it also archives the interactive features and if you have embedded videos on your site, it saves those, so you don't have to worry about YouTube taking down your video and so forth. So I find these two resources very useful for both the ephemeral nature of, of our field and also for copyright uh, protection under fair use. Thank you. Uh, and I really want to bring Lorenzo in on this because the idea of ephemera <laughs> <laughs> is a completely different, I mean, it's very interestingly different in your field. So. Obviously, you're, you're archiving stuff, you're preserving it. It's the, the things themselves might be ephemeral, but then the digital representation, representation becomes the thing you want to preserve. Do you want to talk a little bit about these yeah. issues of digital preservation? I, I mean, as, a, as you say, the, the major point in doing archaeology is that we are destroying things. So the database uh, is for sure one of the way in which we can preserve all the information uh, on which is based our, our knowledge. So it's something that we have, uh, I mean, it's a duty for us to preserve those kinds of information. If any of you work, work uh, 
in one museum and see one ancient object uh, with the label that say a no provenance. Uh, this is no longer archaeological object. This, this is my point. Uh, so it's something that we have to, to really try to do to preserve all those information that allows us to, to, you know, to make the object talks and don't be just object to see and you know, for our pleasure and, uh, and that's all. But there is also a second point because, uh, as I said, uh, with archaeology, we don't work with uh, you a huge quantity of data. So I mean, are pretty much big data set, but are not uh, that big uh, as other things that there are outside in the in the real world. But anyway, we are looking for patterns. So I mean, the computer in this case uh, and the database. Uh, especially a uh, RDF, a graph database, uh, it's a very powerful tool to for try to link together things that our brain is not able by its own to, to map uh, and to associate those kind of, uh, of different entities. So for sure it's something for a uh, preserver, so it's uh, a way in which we preserve the cultural heritage, uh, and it's something for, uh, for tell story, basically, to, to make a narrative that is historical, that is anthropological, and that is, uh, is archaeological. So there is this double nature, at least in my understanding, of the digital world uh, in, uh, in archaeology regarding the, the data management. That's the, the point. Thank you. Another question. There's one over here. Thank you. I found all of the presentations fascinating and spurred on more questions. Um, whenever there's a new technology coming on the scene, there's always a um, vast amount of different formats. And it creates almost like a Tower of Babel. So, you know, for instance, in, in uh, word processing, everyone uses a universal PDF, which is being able to be read by everybody. Um, I was fascinated by the fact that everybody used a different platform, and um, I'm, I'm from City Tech, and we created, uh, not me personally, but the school created a, a, a site called Open Lab. I was wondering whether anyone had heard about this, because not only is it within college, but it is available to anyone in the public. And a lot of the things that you talked about in terms of mapping and, and, and creating uh, projects is on that. So I was wondering, uh, and they use WordPress. So I was wondering that process of deciding among the vast amount of possibilities, which one do you pick? It's like a little bit like uh, VHS versus beta. Which one raises to the top so that everyone can communicate? So that was basically my question. I always, ha I always have something to say. Um, <laughs> so the, the, th the thing about the digital medium is that it's, it's, it's not digital media. It's like it's ones and zeros manifesting themselves in almost infinite forms at this moment. And we're at a point where things are booming and busting and you, you can't tell day to day almost. So there are certain patterns that I think tool choosers look for. Um, one of them is um, interoperability and openness. Uh, so, you know, Lorenzo's using MySQL, which is an open database language, and it is the understructure for WordPress and Omeka. And, um, and MySQL has a lot of heft that way because when you get open source movements like that, once they get to a certain amount of momentum, there are large enough communities that sustain them and keep them forward looking. Um, so you, what we do as digital humanities people is try to pay attention to those trends and pick tools that will have momentum. I, I started doing a lot of this back in 2004 and whether WordPress was gonna stay relevant or not was still up for, up for grabs. Um, now re WordPress runs 27% of every web page out there. <clears throat> which is a ridiculous number. Um, and I actually moved back to WordPress because it was such a universally accepted tool that you could also rely that certain students would be familiar with it or it was likely that they would end up using it. So at a pedagogical framework, you're, you're teaching them an embedded language. Um, and then a tool like Omeka has picked up momentum and is based on WordPress principles, so it's easy to enter and access into it, and it's also using the same PHP and MySQL. So those are interoperability. The interoperability allows for preservation because they're usually, usually using open data standards that allow you to transfer 
transfer from one place to another place if your tool goes dead, um, which I mentioned before. So those are a lot of choices that that you have to know if you're doing a lot of this and that we try to share as those of us who are doing it a lot with other people. Um, Sebastian Heath, who's over there, and we do a lot of 3D, we were talking about 3D modeling the other day, and there are different ways of doing 3D modeling. Some of them are proprietary and closed off by companies. Some of them are more accessible, and you want to try to do the more accessible ones that are open because there's more likely that those things can turn over. So it's true in the text, it's true in images, it's true in 3D models, but they're moving so quickly that it's, you have to pay attention to it a lot. Um, Yeah, I mean, I know Open Lab, and I know that I one of the students who built it is on the journal collected that we mentioned before. So, and and that's one nice thing about New York is that the community actually communicates a lot, um, and and across CUNY and NYU, and we've already done stuff together. So, I think it's one of the important things about NYCDH that's bringing people together across the city, and also our attempts to build NYUDH is to have. Uh, a more of a kind of role in that conversation and, and to try and build that kind of communication. Yeah. Uh, who are next? Hi, I'm um, Jonathan Ned Katz, the founder of outhistory.org, um, the major website on LGBT, you know, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer history. <laughs> um, it started out using MediaWiki mm -hmm. software. And then uh, it got redesigned um, with um, Omeka. And it, it, when uh, the media wiki, it seems to me, required like about seven steps to create content. Omeka, it, in my experience, requires like 75 steps to create content. So I was very surprised to hear you call Omeka um, easy to use. I have not personally found it easy to use in comparison to the media wiki. I'd be really interested in this. I've never seen major criticisms of Omeka online. I've looked for them and I haven't seen them from this point of view of my experience. I'm, I'm, we can talk on the side some. I can, I teach about it. I, I teach Omeka a lot so yeah. Yeah, it might be the use case scenario. Yeah. Well, I think it's a, a major issue of how easy it is to put content on a site. There's a general problem here that I have not found discussed because time is really a major issue for, for people, for some people. I mean, uh, it, a lot of it has to do with picking the tool that works for your project, right? So Omeka worked for my project because Omeka has an object-based epistemology. It wants to put things in object sectors and then connect those objects. And then Exhibit Builder, the essay tool, is built on gathering those objects and surrounding them with text. So if your project isn't about that, then you're going to have a really hard time getting what you want out of Omeka. Um, if, you're, if your project is more about building pages with text and embedded media, then WordPress works really well for that. If you want to do a collaborative platform, use MediaWiki. So a lot of the times, if you're using the wrong tool, then you'll get some dissonance there. So, Thank you. Just one more question before we're going to have to break, I'm afraid. This is for Lorenzo. Do you worry about platform drift in the database that you're building f in the archaeological work you're doing? And, and if you do worry about platform drift, how do you address that? What do you mean with platform drift? In other words, you're Sorry. building a comprehensive database yeah. and analytics on s platforms that will change and evolve over time and mm. may not be accessible in 10 years yeah. as we see technology evolve so quickly. Yeah, sure. So how, how, do you, how do you keep your data safe and able to translate across the changes that technology will I mean, bring. It, it's something that we are still doing uh, because, uh, as I say, the, the database is made in MySQL, uh, but we already make uh, an exact copy of the database in RDF structure. Right. That will be the next step in the database. So it's, it's, it's the future, right? This is just because MySQL is a well-developed and safe technology. It's easy to, you, to use, uh, but in a few years, uh, my feeling is that uh, in database, uh, the, the basic way to go will be with graph databases. And we are already at that level. 
And in addition, all our data are in paper form because when we are in the field, uh, we are without computer. We, you are in Southern Turkey in the middle of nowhere and you write with your pen or your paper. So we have the paper copy of everything. Uh, we have the MySQL file uh, and it's possible, you know, MySQL, you can go in whatever other relational database without any problem. So you can change uh, a database system without any, any issue. And with a mapping file uh, in less than one minute, uh, after that you wrote the mapping file, you can translate uh, all the relational structure in RDF structure in 30 seconds. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's possible to switch from one platform to the other without big issues. So, yeah, if I could just add, so <coughs> Lorenzo and I are working on a tutorial together. That slide where he shows his MySQL going to R to the to database to Heidi SQL, MySQL, he Lorenzo has proven that even though we don't know what the exit route is going to be, that he currently has like six different ways of getting his data out of <laughs> the six different tools. And hopefully that projects forward into whatever tool standard comes along. So, so we hope as a matter of practice that we can meet the future that we don't know what it's going to be. Thank you. This, this reminds me that uh, one of the m figures who's run one of the major literary archives in my field turned out to have a garage full of boxes of paper with the whole thing printed out. <laughs> I suspect this is not uncommon amongst archivists and, and database builders. Thank you very much. I'm just going to keep Thank us you. on time and stop there. Thank you once again to our speakers.